Okay, so the next thing on the docket, we're just gonna do a quick, uh, another hands-on thing. Um, and I think we'll just maybe code this together. Um, it's not too much different than just exactly what we've been talking about, but um, it might just go, I wanna get, I'm always kind of worried about the, the time and I wanna get to the stuff, make sure we get to the stuff at the end, so, but I don't wanna just blow through the exercises either, so uh, maybe just this, uh, if you go into this uh, exercises folder, that's the place where we just got those R scripts lined up, and there's this one called Z hyphen pack um, that we did. Um, this is a model for azithromycin PK that it was actually published for uh, treatment of malaria. But I kind of turned it into a, a, a community acquired pneumonia example. Um, so it says you've been sick for the last two weeks, you can't take it anymore. Finally, you decide to go to the doctor, and the doctor gives you a diagnosis of walking pneumonia. This actually happened to my daughter. Um, she went home on some uh, Zithromax. Um, and when you get home with your Zithromycin prescription, you start wondering about the directions, which is to take 500 milligrams as a single <coughs> dose on day one, followed by 250 milligrams once daily on days uh, two through five. So the, uh, just the five doses. Um, um, I don't know what it's, what it's like in Europe, but this is like super, I was a pharmacist in, for a while and this is super, super popular. Then now it doesn't really work anymore for pretty much anything, but uh, I think they still do a lot of uh, Zithromax. So it just says explore this reg regimen using the following model. Um, and so part of this was to kind of read in the model um, uh, and then just simulate, I, I asked you to just to simulate out to at least day 14 to see what's happening. So it kind of got me thinking like if you, if you, get, if you go on a, like, a, like a high dose of amoxicillin, it'll be at least a 10 day uh, course of that. And so I started kind of thinking about this and kind of hopefully we can kind of look at why that is. So um, I'll just, uh, so the, the idea on these exercises is that we just kind of start the problem out for you and give you some starting code and then we'll, we're gonna fill it in. Um, so let's just do this um, azithro. I'm gonna get this up toward the top, maybe a little bit bigger. And this is in the model directory. Um, I'm gonna run that. So that's our azithromycin model. Oops. Part of this is just getting the, uh, the mechanics down here. So this is just a PK model. We've got uh, absorption rate constant. Um, uh, this is three compartment model, um, and we've got weight as a covariate. We'll do some population simulation with this later. We can say um, I got this off of. Uh, no, I did. Get, I did get this out of the the, the publication, um, the Meropenem one. I got off of DD Moore. Um, anyway, um, we got our ODE section, so it's just a basic three compartment model. Um, and then um, here is, this is like our dollar PK. Well, again, we'll get into the, the model specification later on, but we've got clearance um, is, a, is a, a function of weight and same with the, um, the other clearance and the volumes. Um, and then we've got some random variability on clearance and uh, V1. Uh, and so, uh, we just want to do just a, determin a fixed deterministic simulation with this, uh, and just to show you this. So if I would if I would have just read this model in, I could, there's a function called revar, and that'll show you the random effects variances. So that'll pull out the omega and the sigma matrix for me. Um, and we don't we just we don't want this to have any uh, deterministic uh, or any random stuff on it. So I just there's another function called zero RE that we pipe the model to. And so when we run that, that just says zero out all the random effects. And so now all the ADAs, all the ADA variances are zero and you're gonna get just a fixed effect simulation. So you can code these random effects in your model and you can just say at runtime, you can just say, hey, just don't simulate these random effects. You don't have to go and delete the ADAs and that kind of thing. Um, and so that's what that z the zero RE thing is. Right. Yeah. I did the command uh, what is written on uh, the left, yeah, all the lines. Then I wrote C mod, uh -huh. and I still see some eta. Yep. So like the the when you when the model gets compiled, that just it saves the text of the model. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, and so that's just where the model came from. So any updates that you do after that aren't going to be reflected in that. So that'll just show you the source. So we can't go in and change the source code. Yeah. But at this point, if she does param mod, that would show. Yeah. So, so, the, so that, that, that's why we do stuff like this. So that's why we do this, where you can, that's why we're emphasizing interrogating the object rather than um, looking back at the code. Yeah, but if I do C mod, mod is my object. Yeah, right, and so that the, the, the goal of that function is to return the source code for uh, where the model came from. C. This is not the right function I should use. Okay. Yeah, so that's why we're emphasizing using these in functions to interrogate what the actual values are. Mm -hmm. That's why you use rever or um, you can say omat. That'll just give you the omega matrix. Um, this is a little bit farther down the line, but I just wanted to point what we're doing here out. Pram. So, yep. Okay. Um, so our regimen is uh, 500 milligrams is a single dose on day one, followed by 250 milligrams once daily on days two through five. Can't tell you how many times I've written that out on a on a, on a prescription, but uh, so um, the way I'm, um, so we're just doing just a single uh, profile here. And so I'm going to just make a, going to make, I'm just going to put this together kind of stepwise here. Uh, so I'm going to do that, that bolus dose like this. That's the first dose. And then the second one. You can code along. If you can think of a different way to do this, please go ahead. There's a couple of different ways to do it, but I'll do it in a certain way. Um, so then I'm going to do that 250 milligram dose every 24 hours. And then we want to do that days two through five. So that's going to be for an additional three. So this, the dose here on line 24 is going to get me the first uh, 250 milligram dose plus an additional three for a total of four. And just, um, so we've got our kind of two event objects here. Um, so the, the loading and the maintenance regimen and then we can put that together. I'm gonna do this a, a couple different ways. So we can put this in a sequence where we can say first do E1 then wait, wait for 24 hours, and then do E2. Like the other way you could do this, um, so I could say, uh, I'm gonna make this E3 object, and I say, Amount is equals 500, and then it's got a dosing interval of 24. And that's all I got to write. And I could say, now I'm going to do E3 and then E2. And what that gets me is that just says if I didn't put this I, I equals 24 on there, it would do that dose and then it would immediately start the 250 milligram dosing. So this I, I equals 24 just says, oh, there's an interval and when it when energy self puts the doses into a sequence, it waits one dosing interval after the dose to start the next one. So this is sort of like, these are like equivalent ways of doing it. This is just forcing a waiting time uh, on there. Hopefully it comes out the same. <laughs> So sort of the, uh, then I guess like the other way you could have done this would, would be, um, we could have, we could have made this uh, kind of the sort of maintenance, I guess dosing you could call it. That I could just say, I know this is, supposed to start on day two, so I'm going to make that time equals 24. 
then I then I can just do e uh, what is it e1 and then e4 and I should get the same thing so that's a that collection operator just puts these two uh, into a just smashes them together and so I have to say what that uh, that starting time is So then now I've got my model object. So I kind of did the work to put that event together, and I'm just now I just pass this in. Oops. Say this is my event. And uh, that runs, and then I'm just gonna remind myself that I want to get the CP compartment. So you can either um, just plot this whole thing out and you'll get sort of everything. Uh, or um, this plot, again, it's sort of based on lattice. So I can say, I can put in a formula. I just want concentration versus time. And that'll just let me exclude uh, some of that. If I wanted to have concentration plus the Perifer uh, peripheral, or I'll say peripheral. Oops. Perif not found. Shoot. It's per. It's per. per two. Yeah. So like, this is like another reason why we kind of do this. So I say, oh, it's not found. What, what do I call it? You can just check the initial conditions and say, oh yeah, it's per two. So now you can get the, these two. So you can kind of customize this, the plotting a little bit depending on what you're looking at and things like that. Yeah? Can you create a file to export the directly? Yes, um, I believe you can. Um, but I, I can, um, yeah, so you could probably wrap this in, uh, yeah, in the PDF function, you could, you could save this as a plot and then just wrap it into a PDF function, but I just do it so rare. I always use ggplot, so I would, yeah. Could you please repeat again what does this zero Yep, yeah, so um, what, what is, so the question was, what does that zero RE do? So as kind of Celine noted that, um, so you can see like, uh, for, I've got an omega matrix for the random effects, and I've got some residual error matrix, and these are all zeros. Um, but if you look back at the the the, the, the model source code, um, it had a omega block. It had some variances on those, and zero re just goes into the model object and just turns all those variances to zeros. So it's saying, well, this is a population model. I'll get this variability in it but I want to do just a fixed effect type simulation. You can just kind of do that on the fly without having to edit your model or anything like that. There's a, and, and we won't talk about it today, but there's also a way to change those values. So I could change them to different variances or a different matrix and stuff like that. So all that's updatable. And this is just a special case that just says, just turn them all to zeros. I want a, a deterministic uh, simulation. Yeah. So the the um, so this so energy solve never um, it never goes back and change writes code. It can't write this code back to you. And so the way that you do it is you um, is you have these functions. This is how you do it. So I can say, tell show me what this uh, uh, what the current values of this. Uh, Omega matrix is whether well, they're zeros, and that's how you do it. There's a but there's a if you want, you can do this. Uh, um, I think this will do it. So, as list is a common uh, uh, method in, uh, in R where you can just turn stuff into a list. So, this will kind of extract a bunch of this stuff out for you. So the, the, these are the stuff we, you might never know what it means, but a, a lot of stuff you might. 
um, if you say a uh, list and it was omega, you can also do that. But it's just the same thing as doing that extractor function. Yeah, except that you have to know the name of the function. Here it's the recommended. Yeah, so that, that's why we say, uh, I always use this rebar function. Yeah. Yeah. You have to know that it's yeah, that's, that's, it's Yeah, sure, it's documented. And, um, and so it's one of the functions that's in there. So is OMAT. It's just like OMAT or param or there's a extract. This little, there's a there's just a formal way of going into the object to getting these things, and it's it's an API for the object. Yeah. So that's just part of you learning the package and, and things. Um, and I think I wanted to be sure to do this out to. Um, I said to do it out to 14 days. Actually, I'm going to look at. Uh, You can see this this second peripheral compartment, like days after the dosing's done, this thing's kind of still hanging out. And so I'm gonna say end, just to be sure, it's gonna be 14 times 24. So I can be sure that I run this out to 14 days. Um, and so you can see after, um, I mean, it's kind of hard to evaluate exactly how how much is in this compartment? Is it a lot or is it not? But you can see this in this peripheral compartment, this stuff's hanging around for quite a long time. And I think that's why you can get away. I think now they're doing like a three day regimen for Zithromax. And it's just because it's got this huge volume of distribution and the stuff hangs around at the target site for a very long time, even after you stop the dosing. And um, that was sort of the idea behind this, this simulation, just to look at that a little bit. And then just to put together the, 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 uh, the dosing regimen there. So, I think you have already mentioned this point several times, and I think uh, someone asked before: Is it possible to pipe this into a ggplot uh, uh, object right away? Yep. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll just do that. So this this, this can be in the slide, but let's just get to it here. Okay. So. Um, I'm going to modify my code. I'm going to, instead of just dumping this out to a plot, which I do just for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to cut. So you need to cut off the plot piece. Otherwise, that object is going to be a plot. We don't want it to be a plot. We want it to be the simulated data. So I'm just going to run it up to here. And now this out is the, sorry, I'm going to be doing this all day, but so I apologize in advance. But um, So now this is that output object. It's got a class. Uh, I kept it going the whole time, so we, yeah. That's kind of bulletproofing it there, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a class that's got a, it's a, an object that just has a class to it, so we can do things like that plot method. Um, but I can do uh, something like this. So I can coerce it to a, just a data frame. Um, And now it's just plain old data frame. You can do whatever you want with it. Summarize it, plot it. Um, and so if you want it to do, um, usually I don't just pipe it right to ggplot, but the way you do it is you would just say, um, right, so you could do it like that, which I think is, they kind of frown on that syntax. I don't think they don't like to do that. But you could do that um, type of thing if you, if you really needed to. Um. OK, so far so good. And I think we've got, we've, we even have a, uh, we've got a slide on all this stuff. And there's another exercise on this that you'll hopefully see, or that you'll get, uh, see what, all the stuff that's going on here. Okay, so this, um, so any, any other questions or um, do we need to stop here for, uh, stay here for, for a little bit? Are we, are we okay going on? Um, hopefully that the, the hands-on wasn't too different than the examples that we're showing in the, in the code. So um, again, then that, that's a good place to start practicing and things like that to get your sim simulations up and, up and running. 
Um, this slide just says these event objects are really just data frames. So I can course this. So this E1 was an event object. And I can call as data frame on that too. And uh, um, just get this out. So if I wanted to kind of manipulate this or a little bit, we could uh, um, uh, just work with it as a regular data frame. So it's not, a, it's not anything mysterious or anything like that. It just does some checking and it does some defaults when you do the constructor. Um, and really, we'll kind of see how this connects with this. It's called like data underscore set for populations. We'll see that in a little bit. And we just use these. These are convenient. There's a nice constructor. Um, there's some operations. Um, one thing that I'll just show you here um, is that uh, so um, I kind of started adding some uh, functions to manipulate these things. So let's just say um, we said, oh, it wasn't a 500 milligram dose. It was a 750 milligram dose. Um, so I can mutate this. So now I can kind of modify that object on the fly and it stays as this event object. So then I can go back and put them together and things like that. I can filter. So let's see here, E. There's not too much here. This comes up every one, it comes, I think it's fil just filter and mutate right now. But this kind of comes up handy when you're kind of trying to reuse some of the code that you did. You can kind of filter these things down and kind of modify them and they stay as these objects. Um, and that's kind of why we have them. Okay. Okay, so just, uh, this is sort of a quick review. We're still working on this setup. We got a model, we got an intervention. We're simulating and we spent some time taking a look at the data. Um, we load the model with mread or mread cache, but you'll get to know those really well. There's this internal library that you can access. This modlib just returns the location of that, and that's our project directory. And we saw some ex accessor functions um, um, with param and init, and I'll probably add something to the documentation to make it uh, clear that this really goes back to the, that C function goes back to the source code that went into it. Um, uh, and then we looked at some other uh, uh, functions to extract information to see what's going on with the way that the model is currently set up. Um, and then we looked at a little bit with the intervention, we looked at these event objects, coding different uh, data items that are similar to non-mem, and then we looked at different ways to combine these event objects into something a little bit more interesting. Just a little bit, we probably already talked about this here, um, dealing with the simulated output. So we've been seeing this a lot here. So we take the model object, we do a simulation, we can just pipe it to this plot. This plot knows what's in the object, it knows what the output variables are. And so it knows just to plot the compartments and the, and the derived variables here. This is from an effect compartment model. Um, you might've seen me do this here. We just did this too. Um, plot will take a formula. So it did the same way that Lattice does. And so you can say, well, I simulated all this stuff, but I just wanna take a look at the CP and the effect. So we can write a formula here. We can also uh, start to customize the plot a little bit, but I just say I rarely do this. But this just says that anything that you can pass to x, y plot in Lattice, you can pass to these plots too. Um, although I can just, I just very, very rarely have to do that. So, but just, just to give you an idea of how this is working. Um, and the, the plot is really just a way to, just to check to see what happened here. Um, this is a little bit like kind of to your question, Joel, is uh, I can take the model object, I can get do that simulation, and I can pipe this directly to um, um, several of the dplyr functions. So remember, this is what comes out of here is it's, it's essentially a data frame, but it's kind of got its own class. So when I pipe this to mutate, you can kind of see I did, uh, I got all my outputs, and then I've got this arm column on here. I just mutated this just to add a column. Um, but the other point that I wanted to, um, so you could do this to mutate, it could be filter, it could be group by, like most of those are supported, um, those dplyr functions. Um, but you'll notice that now the output from here, it's a tibble. So we're out of that MRG solve object now because we have to, we're, so this really just calls as data frame and then it mutates it and then it gives you the data frame back. Um, and. Uh, so bigger simulations where you, where you can't just dump it out to a plot to see what happens. 
I almost always do something like this. I label it or I filter it or something like that. But then I'm just living in, it's just a data frame. And you can kind of bind them all back together and things like that. Um, so there's this kind of, we built in this pipeline connection to the dplyr functions just to make this look like what you're already doing with your uh, dplyr code. Um, just a little bit about updating. Um, we kind of talked a little, we already did this, uh, talked about this, and there's just kind of two ways to kind of see this, and this becomes a little bit more uh, interesting when, when you're doing project work. So I can update on the fly, so I've got this pipeline, and I can take this model, and I can update the end time to 72 hours and then simulate, um, and that's really like a ephemeral update, so that never, the model object never gets saved back. So we do that once, and then the next time I go to that model object, it's going to be 24 hours or whatever it was before because we never saved it back. Um, if you're working with a model and you're saying, I'm always submitting out to uh, three days of data or whatever, I can call this update function, pass in the model object, set end equals to 72, save this back. Now every time I use that model object, it's going to be 72 hours. So sometimes I want to do this because I just want to make the change. I don't want to ruin the object. Or you can save it back onto itself, or you can save another, save it to another name, mod 72 or something like that. But you can do all these, make these updates persistent. Um, and then a lot of times you'll see this, this is what I do most of the time. So anything that you can pass to update, you can just pass it in an MRD sim and it'll pass that. This is really what this is doing. These two are equivalent. It just says, oh, there's this end time, it's gonna, it knows that's something that it can be updated. And so it just runs this update for you, and so you don't have to run this as a, a second step. Um, what else can I update? So the time, uh, the output times. Um, you can update parameters and compartment initial values. Um, say, I, I don't want this flag, I want that flag. Um, well, I do that a lot. Um, we had a question about solver settings, so that's other stuff that you can set, you can update, so the tolerances absolute tolerance and a relative tolerance. Um, these are other solver settings that you probably don't need except for max steps. And that's just the maximum number of steps that the, you let the solver take before it will stop. It defaults to 2,000 steps and if it can't get to the next time within 2,000 time steps, then it says, oh, I, we exceeded the maximum. And in that case, you just increase the maximum. Um, you can update Omega and Sigma, we probably won't get it to it in this, in this class, but it's similar to the parameter updates. Um, and then just some other things that um, are kind of convenience things. Um, yeah, and this just says, okay, it's just, it's either through this update command or just this, the, the shorthand notation here is just a pass in an MRG sim and that's, it has this inherent um, updating ability so that you don't have to do a separate call in the pipeline. So just a quick word about updating parameters. Um, probably not going to do a demo here because uh, I want to save the time for the hands-on. But so this is actually really important. I'm updating clearance like this, but um, I don't tend not to do it. This is just just for an example. But I just want to show you the syntax here. So remember, we use this param function to extract the parameters out of the model. See, so tell me what the parameters are. Tell me what the values are and things like that. Param also updates the uh, the parameters. So if I say param mod, and I can say CL equals 1.5, that'll set the clearance to one and a half. And I can pass in other things in there too. Yeah. So this would be persistent. You can also do it on the fly. Any of these, you can do it on the fly. So almost all the functions take the model object as a first argument, and it returns a model object like this. And so you could do this on the fly or you can make it persistent. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's all I'll say about that. Um, yep. Question yeah, question, yeah, sorry. Um, if I converted the model object to data frame to do some manipulation, is it possible to convert it back into a model object? Um, is it possible to convert it back? Um, I think there's, so I was toying around with a function that I think it's in there. Um, uh, 
so 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 I was I was thinking a lot about this and uh, uh, I couldn't decide what direction to go and so I gave a couple options and maybe you can try them out and I'm pretty sure this is gonna stay with the package so there's um, so I had this output uh, uh, right, so you're talking about the output, right? You want to manipulate the output and then get it back into the output object? For example, if I want to filter out an um, patient and uh, want to update the model, and then I want to use the output that I converted to the data frame report to filter out that object. And, and you want just do, yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so there's a function called, um, so there's a f function called filter sims. So let me just do this. Um, and I'll say time equals 0 0.1 just to make it easy to see what's going on. So this will basically do what you're saying. So it'll take the, uh, take the simulated object, it'll filter it, and then it'll bring it back to the, as a, as an object. Um, although, so I, I was just struggling with what, whether, how much to support this because sometimes I do want to do it. And, and really the only thing that getting it back into this object does is it lets you do that convenient plotting. Um, I'd say the vast majority of times I'm just filtering this and I just really just want the data frame because I'm going into ggplot. So you, so the, the way it would be, it would be like this. And now it's just the data, it, this essentially does the same thing but it just returns the data frame and then you can just send it to ggplot or summarize it or something like that. Um, so you can do that but I just say most of the time I'm just doing the regular filtering and things like that. Because really, the I mean the I mean there's like a, there's a head and there's a tail like there's a way to just peek at the output and things like that, um, but it's really limited what that ob that object really gets you and it's mainly just the plotting thing is the main thing you get from keeping the simulated data in in that output object format. Okay, so this um, gets a little bit now to the um, uh, controlling the output. So um, uh, this is just an example of, uh, this is called request. So remember when we were looking at the output, um, by default you get ID, you get time, you get all the compartments, and you get all the derived variables. And request lets you say, um, look, I only want this output. And this kind of came from working with the bone model. There was like, you know, between all the derived variables in the compartments, there was like 40 outputs, and usually you're only interested in five of them. And we just didn't want to have to look at all the output all the, all the time. So if I simulate here and I just look at the, the first couple, I get all the stuff here. And if I just said, look, I'm really only interested in the concentration, I can request that, and then I can simulate, and then all I get is I'll always get time, I'll always get ID, and this will just say, I'm not interested in what's in the gut compartment. All I want is CP, and this is called request. It's capital REQ. Um, and it just returns a little bit neater data for you. Um, on the memory side, like if you do have a ton of compartments, like when you do this request, um, it doesn't just filter off all the other stuff, it just never allocates the space for all that other stuff. So there's a potential memory savings here too. So it, it only allocates an output matrix that's got three columns in it rather than um, six or nine columns, and so you just, you, you'll save some space uh, in your memory doing that. Um, but I don't think it's a particularly a time saver necessarily. Um, the other one is OBS only. This is a little bit harder to kind of see here, um, but um, yeah, so um, in the output, so when we do this event object, we've got sort of a dosing you kind of think of this being put together into a, a, a like a data set sort of thing, and there's a dose record and there's observation records. That's how it works. It's not obvious, but that's how it does work. And so in your output, you'll always get a record for the dosing. Whenever a dose happens, you'll get an additional record there. So you can see in this simulation, we get two records at time zero, and one's the observation that we had, and then one's the dose. And I can just say abs only means just don't give me the dosing record. Um, it might just save you a filtering step later on to filter out those to, or to figure out where the EBID1 records are and, and filter them out. Um, so that's just a little bit of uh, convenience thing. 
Um, and that's just another modifier function here uh, to say, just give you the observations. Not stuff that you have to do, but sometimes it just kind of uh, comes in handy. So any questions or comments so far? Or we'll go on to the next deck. Explain. So would we see uh, dosing which differs across individuals? Mm -hmm. We'll do in that. Online or in data set? Uh, that'll be in the data set. Uh, OK, so we cannot use the same methods for different dosing across ID. Yeah. So you'll have, yeah, and we're we're gonna get that into this in this slide deck. Okay. Um, uh, to show you how to put that together. Yeah. yeah. There may yeah, but there's no limitation to complexity in that in that respect. So I'm gonna go back into docs. Um, if you're following along, and I'm gonna take this deck O2. And so this is gonna get us into the different data sets that are available. So we wanna kind of get a little more complicated for what we're doing here. Um, and we're gonna, we're kind of working with, we're still here, we wanna add some kind of population element to, to, to do this. Um, and so we wanna take this model, and we're gonna take our intervention, and we wanna take that intervention and we wanna simulate that into a population. So this isn't quite what you're talking about yet. Um, it's just a variant that we, that we sometimes use, um, but we'll get to the data set. Um, so this is the code and the output, and I'll show you kind of how we got there. And part of the reason why I want to do this is I want it to just be over and over again, just to constantly see this, and you'll see that there's just a limited number of configurations we, we have here. Um, but anyway, we're taking our model object, we've got some dosing sequence here, and now we've got this line called I data set, and we're gonna send in a population there. Um, and we're gonna pipe it to MRD sim, then we're gonna pipe it to plot. So now we've got a population here that we simulated. Um, and that population came from this I data set. We'll, we'll figure out, see how this did. But I data set is one of the data sets that you can use. It wasn't the first one that we implemented, but we kind of constantly came across this situation. We implemented it, and it just turns out to be handy in certain situations. I and I data stands for individual data. So this is a data set that it'll let you specify data that are specific to a, a certain individual. You get one record, one, one ID per row. Um, so we use that pop data frame in the previous one. Remember, we passed in pop. You say, well, where, where did that come from? Um, this is what this is. Um, it's one ID per row, and typically these are names that appear in the parameters list. So we have a model, we've got a parameters clearance, we've got one that's VC, um, KA and stuff. This foo thing just is a kind of nonsense. You can have another column on here and it'll just silently, that just doesn't do anything, it'll silently ignore that. Um, but we've got um, three, there's more than three here. Let me, I know this is why I did this. So we've got 10 people in, in this uh, data set. And so when we pass this population in, we'll get 10 profiles out, and they'll all have a different clearance, volume, and KA, and these are individual level values. So when you start simulating individual one, the first thing MRG Solve is gonna do is gonna go to this data set and it's gonna say, does this person have any new clearance or volume? If it does, I'm gonna grab that and update it, and that's gonna be in effect for the rest of the simulation. And that's why we can go back and simulate here why individual one has a different clearance and volume in KA than individual two and individual three. So this is a quick way to set up a population as long as this is what you want to do. It's not always what you want to do. And just say the same events for everybody in that population. So you had a question or concern. I was wondering if it's a way to simulate with uncertainty. Yes, exactly. So we, we either do this, um, yeah, let's just keep on going and I'll, um, so it could be uncertainty, it could be uh, sensitivity analysis, it could be virtual patients, it could be um, that kind of stuff. And we've, so we've got a random thing here that I did. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second, but I, I just wanna make one more point here. So it's, it's important to say that POP and this population data set and this model are connected via parameters. 
So remember, we looked at that data set, and we've got certain names here. And, and it's important that these names match up. So I didn't, this, isn't, um, this data set wasn't really specifically for this problem, but it kind of illustrates it, right? So we've got a CL, we've got a VC, we've got a KA. So just focus on those three. Um, and uh, so if we look down at the parameters on the model object, we've got a CL and that matches up here. Clearance is gonna get updated. We've got a KA and that matches up here. That's gonna get updated. Oops. V doesn't match up with VC. That won't get updated. Okay. Do we have a warning? Pardon? Do we get a warning? You don't get a warning, but but we made a and there's and we'll um, but we made a function that will inventory this and it'll compare and it'll say check this um, uh, this the check the data set against the model and tell me what's going to get updated. Um, yeah. Um, it's it's. Uh, we, we talked a lot about that, about whether you should get a warning or not. There's just a lot of times when you've got a lot of other junk in the data frame um, where um, I think you don't want a warning, it's gonna be too many warnings. Yeah, um, but, but, we, but we do provide this inventory function that'll tell you this. Um, and that's in all the production work I do, I inventory the data frame before I run the simulation and that's what we use for the warning. So I'm a bit lost. So this pop, uh, it's a data set that's created automatically from the model? No, nope. I made this by myself. Okay. And we'll make one in one of the examples. I, I said, I want to simulate 10 people. There's some variability in clearance, some variability in volume and stuff like that. Um, and that's yeah. then outside MRG sold? Yep. Okay. okay. There, there's, a, there's, there's one kind of semi-helpful helper function but this is pretty easy to put together. Um, and I'll show you what this kind of helper function is. But it's really up to you to say what you want these values to be. Um, to say, what do I want them to be according to a distribution? Are they empirical based estimates from my non mem run? Are they, that, that kind of thing. Okay, but, but then we are simulating outside MRG solve. And I thought that with MRG solve we would simulate based on a certain distribution I mean, it will. It, it'll put some random variability on your parameters for you. Um, but there's like a uh, hundred different ways why, where you might want to come up with this, right? Um, okay, so if I could, yeah, maybe check. I could jump in. So you can do it within MRG solve. So if you have yeah. a population model with, with datas and, and sigmas and you want to simulate within MRG solve, you can, you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, this is useful, uh, an example is if you have a non-mem run and you have tabled your post hoc estimates, so your, your individual clearances, and then you want to simulate back exactly those individuals from the post hoc estimate, you could call that table in and have it read clearances and volumes and days from that. Uh, you could likewise just put the non-mem file in and, and allow it to randomly this is a case where if you want those values to be read in from somewhere else, or if for some reason you were doing something you know, kind of funny or whatever it may be, you can generate those parameter values outside of that like you solve and read them in. So you can do it either way. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, like the, sort of the other way to kind of think about this, and kind of thing we're kind of getting here too, you can also think about it as this is how you kind of do sensitivity analyses. So we just sort of this random mix of parameters in that previous one, and we just wanted to make some variability. But let's say I wanted to systematically vary a parameter like clearance here, so I want to vary clearance from 0.5 to 1.5 by 0.25 units, kind of this simple example. This expand I data, um, this is that semi-helper, semi-helpful function, it's really, Minimal, but what this does is it, it puts an ID column on it for you, and it'll basically, so it's like the expand grid, so there's an expand grid function that will do all combinations of inputs. So you put in a bunch of vectors and it'll do all combinations of those vectors. Here I've just got one, and so it's just, there's just one combination. But what it does is it gives me a data frame, it gives me an ID column. I know my model has a parameter called clearance, um, 
And now when I simulate from this, I can get this, um, right, so I got my model, I'm gonna pass this in as an I data set, I've got some interventions that I'm interested in, and I can get this systematic variation in the parameter where I'm doing like this sensitivity analysis where I want it to go from here to here by this value. So you can start to see what happens to the, uh, the clearance here um, across different values. So either random population or batch or sensitivity analysis is a way you can kind of think of this. So it's got a couple different sort of uses here. And again, this is sort of our second kind of workflow here. It's our model plus the I data set plus event. Um, and this is just one kind of simple way to do a, sort of a population simulation. Oops. I thought I had a, all right. Maybe we'll do, we can do a hands-on, I've got a hands-on thing that I think just didn't make it in the slide deck related to the I data sets, but let's just go through the data set just to get to the, to the end of this and then we can kind of go back and maybe you can even decide what you want to work on. Um, but, so we had this um, kind of, the simple event object simulation, we had this event plus I data, and this kind of data set is that, is sort of like the dosing equivalent to I data. Um, so, um, and this is hopefully starting to look a little bit like your non-mem data set, where you've got IDs, you've got an amount column, all your times, and we've got just people in a data set with some events, uh, some event records associated with them. This is a, we'll talk a little bit about these functions. This is like expand grid again, but it's called expand EV. And this will do all combinations of the doses here. Um, one, um, which is sometimes helpful uh, if you wanted to do multiple people at multiple doses and things like that. Um, but the other thing that it does give you is it gives you the, the same defaults as you got. So you have to specify a time in the data set. So it'll default at time zero. That's just what we want most of the time. It'll give you this def dose uh, business and it'll give you the default EVID. And so it just saves you a little bit of a typing on there. And, and obviously you can put all these in and, and make them what you want to make them. Um, but again, we're just making, now this is just a plain old data frame. Um, and we can pass this in with the model object. Now we've got data underscore set. And this is our full data set. This has got all the information about the population and all the inter interventions. We pass this in. We can simulate, and now we get those three profiles that we just coded up before. Um, so this is kind of like the same way we did before, but now um, I think we don't have any variability in the parameters, but we've got variability in the doses, right? That's why the, that well, that's why all these three um, profiles are different is because they're getting different doses. Um, and this is probably what I use probably most of the time on kind of traditional PKPD type modeling work, where you want to say a popula say what the population is, you want to kind of assign different people to different doses and things like that. Um, the data set can also carry parameters. So just like the I data set, right, we match those up with the, um, the parameter names with the, uh, the model uh, with the column name. So now I've got, I'm using this expand EV again, and this is where this kind of comes in handy a little bit. So I want to do um, three different doses at a bunch of different, uh, three different clearances. So I can do expand EV, this will expand grid, it'll give me all combinations of doses and clearances. Um, and just looking at the, the head of the data frame here, um, we've got the ID column here, that's what this gives us here. Um, we've got uh, the low clearance, all three doses. We've got the medium clearance, we've got uh, all three doses, and then we've got the uh, even higher, the highest clearance, we'll have all three doses. So we've got all these people with these different doses um, and different clearances now. And when we simulate this out, um, the, uh, uh, I'll talk about what this is in a minute. But we got the model object, we're just passing in the data set again, all that kind of complexity is hidden in there, but we just pass it in as data. Um, we can simulate and then we can plot 
Um, this has got a little bit more plotting going on here where we've got the three different doses and we've got the different clearances within those. Any questions? Um, I mean, we'll kind of keep on going a little bit with this. Um, but any questions on the data set stuff so far? So can we have different dosing uh, scheme uh, across I? Mm -hmm. Yep, you can be arbitrarily complex. Okay. The ID, so the, um, it can be a mix of anything. Um, the ID here um, works like non-mem ID. So it's not, I mean, I always code it as their unique IDs. But for MRD solve, when the ID changes to MRD solve, that's a new ID. So you get an ID one up here, an ID one at the bottom of the data set, and they're going to be different people. So it follows that same, I think, the same convention of what NotMem does. Um, this is just a simple thing where we've got each person just has a single thing, but we could have, and we'll get to an example where different people have multiple records, or they've got totally different records, and that kind of stuff. If you can put this together, you can see away from it. Um, and then um, this is sort of a, just a demonstration example because we're probably not going to put clearance on here. This is probably going to be your covariates instead, and that's going to feed into the model, and that's, we'll get to the afternoon to see how to put those into the model. Um, but this is going to be like weight and EGFR and a study ID or whatever is going to all go in there. Um, and that's another good thing. So um, just because this, this data set is getting passed into C++ code, this gets turned into, this has to get turned into a matrix, and so you can only have numeric data in here. So it's like non them that way. Um, and uh, if you do have non-numeric data, it'll drop it with a warning. So that will, we will give you a warning there. Um, but it'll, it'll drop it out, and it'll um, um, try and keep on going for, for, for you. It's just, uh, it would be unusually, uh, complicated to handle if you allowed any kind of data to come in there it would be it would be a, a lot of work and kind of difficulty to figure all that out so we just say yeah that's just one of the requirements it's, it's, it'll only take numeric input um, so you might have seen this so let's just talk about this a little bit here um, so I took my data set here um, so starting from here I've got ID I've got amount blah 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 um, but this is really kind of like the dose, and, and, um, and on the plot, I wanted to summarize those profiles by the dose that they got uh, assigned. Um, and so what I did here is I, I took this data frame and I just added a column called dose, and I set it equal to amount. And when I do the simulation, I passed in an argument called carry out, and I gave it the character name of that column, dose. And so what carry out does is it looks into your input data, and if it finds a column that you list here, it'll copy that column into your output. So use it for like dose group or treatment arm or something like that, because I knew I wanted to make this plot, and it would be, I mean, not impossible, but it would be more work to go back and just say, oh, what, what person was with what dose, and now I can just carry this out, and now I've got, if I want to summarize by that dose, I have to do that. The reason why you can't just take a mount is because Remember, this gets expanded into dosing records and observation records, and um, AMT is going to be zero on all the observation records. And so we have to copy it to dose, and then dose will just, it's MRD cell just says, oh, it's just another column in there. It doesn't have any special meaning to it. Um, so this is a handy thing to have when you know you want to summarize by something that's in the input data set. The limitation here is that a lot of times you want that to be a factor or a character treatment arm, and they're just right now there's just no way to pass that through. Um, but you can pass through like a numeric indicator and then join the data set back on. Um, and that's just probably going to be like that for a while. So this carry out is kind of another one of these kind of convenient things. Um, the I need to get the syntax kind of straightened out. There's the part of this is legacy stuff, um, what the argument or what the, that argument name was. But most of the time, I do this carry out is that there's a function called carry underscore out, and you can pass in an unquoted name of a column to carry out. It's equivalent to what we saw before, 
Um, I haven't changed the function argument, but I'm trying to move to these underscores, um, and it's just something I got in there a long, long time ago. Um, but if you do it like this, it's always carry underscore out, and you can save some quotation marks there. But again, it just gets you this, when you simulate like this, it gets you this dose column and the output, and you can summarize your plot by that dose. Um, just a slide on here, just to remind you that this data set is like the EVID, so you got the, these columns are the same names, so the same stuff you put in event objects, you can put in the data set. Um, and they're really kind of similar, except just you've got more people, and you, and you can have, um, I guess it's not really more complexity, but you can just have an arbitrary number of people in the data set. Um, and then you can just tack on the, the parameters or covariates onto that data set as well. So, but they're kind of just the, under the hood it's a similar type of thing, but we just want that flexibility with that um, data sets. So we've kind of seen the three simulation setups that we do. Um, we've got this model uh, object plus a model object plus the event object, and that gives us a single simulated profile, always. We've got this model object plus I data set plus of an object, and just that'll give us the number of profiles that'll give us is the number of people in this I data set. So that's a way to code in a population if you if you want to do it like this. And then we've got this model object plus the data set, and we've crammed all the dosing and the population information into that data <coughs> set. And however many IDs are in this data set, that's the number of profiles we'll get out. So when I'm kind of, you know, working with a model on different levels, right? And sometimes I'm just getting started. And I want to play around with a model. I might want to do something like this. If I'm doing a predict uh, VPC, I might want to do something like this. If I'm doing QSP work and you know I just don't have, I've got kind of a simpler setup here, and I want to really focus on the variability and the parameters, I might do this. So I, th I always think about what level I'm, am I working with a model at, and what would be the easiest to get done what I want to do. Um, this one. Plus, I didn't understand the clearly the first bullet. So you said we will always get one profile, but if the omega is not zero. Y yeah. So this, yeah. So what? What if omega is not zero? That just means that every time you run the simulation, you'll get a different profile, but you'll just get one profile. So you're going to say omega different than zero, then n equal to ten, and I get ten profiles. Yeah, there, there's a way to do it, but just don't. There, there's a yeah. Okay. You'll if you dig into the MRG sim function, there's an NID column that'll just. But it's really just for demo. It's just for just. I mean, it's just I almost never use it for production work. It's really just for demoing or just kind of playing around. Okay. Um, you can in, in R2 to add that. You can set the seed. And if you did that, then every time you ran that one individual, you get the same yeah. back. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so yeah, so you can there. There is an argument called NID, and it'll do that. It'll do ten people um, with this, and it'll spit it out. But it's just it, it's almost never. I try not to say it, um, but it's almost never what I do. What I want to do for any kind of production kind of work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the first one is not the deterministic simulation. It's a stochastic simulation with just one individual. This one? The first one, yes. Yeah. This just depends on what the value of omega is. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you can technically, so you can technically tag on parameters into this, into the events object too. So if you throw them in there, it'll take carry them along. And it, I mean, you can see this event object, it just gets turned into a data set under the hood. That's all I mean. Yeah, there's no really. There's no, yeah. It's just a really, it's a, it's, um, it's, it's all happens under the hood. So you can tuck a parameter into here, and you can get that parameter to pass through. Um, but I just wouldn't really, I, d I do it, but you kind of have to really know what you're doing. Um, um, but yeah, so the, the, what, de what determines whether this is deterministic or not is whether you've got an omega matrix and it is in your model. Yeah, so the, um, I mean, we can just 
since we're on it, let's just do it. Um, and then the follow-up question, so if we want to have a plot with a typical profile and then several individual profiles, then how would we do it? If you want to have a plot with a typical and several individuals? Yes. Um, you probably have to do a couple simulations. But I, I rarely do that. I usually just simulate a population and then take the median. And, uh, yeah. Also, you can just uh, set the yeah. yeah. typical parameter value to one data set and get the plots for these typical values and then use the one that yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let me just grab this again here. Okay. So I'm just on the uh, the uh, uh, azithromycin model. Okay. So there's that one thing you can do. So we can do 30 people like that, and that'll just basically do what you're saying. Um, but the important thing here, um, I guess I gotta just, um, right. So you can kind of see like every time you, oops, every time you run this, you get a different answer because it's constantly re, re kind of simulating that. So what you do, if you set the seed here, we we'll get one more new one, and then after that it's the same. So this will respect the seed that you get set in R, um, and it's really just from that simulation on, right? So it's that draw of all the etas. And that kind of thing. And there's obviously sigmas here uh, at stake too, um, but it, it'll respect that seed. Yeah. Is it going to have the seed for all the functions with the random simulation after? Because, for example, if at that point you want to simulate always the same ones, then you need to set the seed here. Yep. But if after you want to do some really random process, then can you consent the seed setting? Yeah, yeah. So you can, yeah, if you can get more sophisticated about resetting and things like that and yeah um, but most of the time you kind of I just put in a number there and just I want to make sure it's reproducible that's kind of my main concern there but you, yeah if you get more sophisticated about truly random and that kind of stuff I think there's other packages to help you with that yeah uh, does it uh, simulate without residual error by default yeah so does it sim simulate without residual error by default I think on this one I just have a I just set this to zero, okay. um, and there's a value in there, and it's just so it just depends on what this is set to. So I could just here, I'll, I mean, we'll just do it. Uh, so uh, so I could say, um, can everyone see that? Okay, is that big enough? Okay. Uh, what was it? So I can make this to so I can update that. Oops. Uh, do I need to do this? Yeah. So I can just as soon as I put something in that vari that variable, it'll start simulating this with that residual error on there. And it looks just kind of funny because we have a really intense kind of sampling scheme and it's just kind of constantly drawing that random error there. Um, but for just a lot of the demo stuff and I'm gonna say for some of my project work, I'm, I really want just kind of iPred type stuff. Um, but it's up to you, you control it. And,
for the demos for the demo stuff I just tend to zero that out because it just we I just want people to see like the the, the iPad type profiles and that kind of thing. Um, and this will we we've got this we'll have some hands on where or some one of the demos where we'll do this kind of thing. We'll simulate from the posterior from a non mem run and we'll kinda of update this sigma matrix and omega matrix. And that'll come through here. Okay, so um, yeah, was there any other questions up to this point? We'll keep going with the data sets a little bit. Okay. Um, so wait a minute. So where did this data set came from? And you know, um, this really is just a data frame. There's nothing special about it. Any way you want, any way you can put this together, please feel comfortable to do. So you don't have to put it together in a certain way. Um, what we noticed in our work that we were kind of constantly repeating different types of work and we said okay let's just make it easier to do this um, and so I'll just do a couple slides on some of the functions that we provide that might make your life easier but just don't feel limited by what these these uh, um, these functions are so we just kind of found in our experience these have been helpful we're always looking for more functions like this to do so we're looking for things that we're doing over and over again we say okay we need to wrap this up into a function um, and I hope that this is part of uh, like what the convenience of MRG solve is, is that we've got this data set that could be potentially a lot of data assembly for you, but we want to make it a, a quick way to put these together. So these are, these are some of the functions. We already saw this expand EV function. This is like expand grid. And so if I say um, ID is one and two and amount is uh, 100 and 200, so this will do all combinations of these. Um, but um, what it does is it whatever the output is, is it renumbers the IDs in all the rows. So this just says, I want two, I, two people at each of two doses. So it gives me two people at 100 milligrams and two people at 200 milligrams. And by definition, ID is one per row here. That's kind of what that does. Um, whether or not it's obvious or not, um, that's just, this is where it's, this is what it started out and we said, oh, we need, we need to get more, we want to do more than this. Um, but a lot of times this is really kind of what you want. You just want to make the skeleton and um, I want, I've got three different doses I want to look at and I got a hundred people at each dose. This makes it really easy to do. Um, and again, you can see we kind of started off with dots a long time ago and we're trying to slowly transition to underscores. Um, this is sort of another way to do it. So EV underscore rep. So this takes an event objects and it replicates it uh, in a certain population. So I can take any event object and I said I don't want one person, I want five people. So I can do five IDs and it'll repeat this um, into five people. Which just seems kind of a, it kind of seems like the expand grid kind of thing. But the nice thing about um, this function here, and I don't know if I've got an example. So remember we put together those complicated event objects? Like they could be even more complicated than that, but a lot of times what the data assembly framework is, is make your event objects, put them together into this treatment sequence that you want, and then replicate it into a certain population. And that's an easy way to ramp this up um, kind of efficiently. Um, oh yeah, here, I think I've got a, I've got a, um, more complicated. So I've got the sequence, so I've got a dose, we gotta wait for 36 hours and then do some other doses. Um, here I forgot, I had the wrong, uh, uh, this is actually capital ID and I got a warning here saying that it's deprecated so I just didn't, I just didn't do this properly. Um, but anyway, I've got this little bit more complicated event object and I can replicate it into two people. Um, just keeping it small just to see, just so we can see what happens here. So I got one person that does the sequence and I got another person that does the sequence. And it's kind of nice when there's like a thousand people or something like that. Um, and you can put these together. This is a little bit different. Um, this is called as underscore data, underscore data set. And here, what we've got here is we're building a data set and we're, um, taking event objects here. So we've got maybe three different treatment arms. We've got a different number of people uh, randomized to each treatment arm. 
Um, I'm just kind of, again, keeping this small so we can look at the input and the output here. So we've got this first arm, we've got two people to get this 100 milligrams every 12, three people getting 200 every day, and then four people getting 150 um, every day. And basically what it'll do is it'll go through and it'll expand these uh, event objects into the population. And uh, the big kind of convenience here, I think, is that what it does is it lets you say, I want this many people in each arm, but it'll go through and it'll renumber the IDs for you so that each person we get here, um, we get two, uh, five, we get nine distinct people and they um, all go into these different arms. And I could tuck like an arm, usually I tuck an arm indicator into the end of this so I could tell the arms apart. Yep. Can you extract these to give it to random? Sure. Um, and a lot of times, so so the um, so you could um, you could write this out. To, you could use, and I do this. So you could use this as sort of starter material for non-non data sets. Um, but you'll um, and one thing we haven't I haven't really said, but um, so one thing you'll notice here is that there's no observation records in this data set. Okay, um, and you could put observation records in here, and and this is and this is the deal. I almost always do it like this because I don't want to have to put in the observation records. And so when you make a data set and they've all got, they've got zero EVID zeros, MRD self says, oh, I'll put in the observation records for you. And it takes it from that time grid, right? That start and delta add. And it'll pad in those observations for you. It says, you don't have to do it, I'll do it for you. If you did want to say, well, no, I, I want to have these observations at these times are different for different individuals. You can always put it together. You can put the observation records. If MRD cell finds one observation record in the data set, it'll say, oh, you're taking care of the observations. I'll take them from your data set. Okay? So we cannot enforce uh, specific time. Uh, you can, so you can. You can enforce the specific times for specific people. So you can take your non-non data set, you can pass it off to MRD solve, maybe with some limitations here and there. And you'll get, you can simulate, you'll get all the doses and the observations from that kind of clinical data set with odd times, unbalanced, and all that stuff. But when you're doing this de novo simulation, I don't want to take time to make all those observation records. They're probably coming from a standard time grid anyway. Yeah, this is what I'm, uh, I'm wondering is that, uh, let's say I want the full profile, but I want to make sure uh, at rough I will have a solution. Yep, sure. You can so do that if I add a line here, will I get the profile before? Yeah, so you'll get whatever that simulation time grid is that you put in. Yes, um, and if not the additional uh, time before. No, you'll, so yeah, so the by, by default, um, here, <laughs> so by, um, So you, you actually end up getting a little bit more than you probably want. So this, so this, this will go, this will give you observations from zero to 240, yeah. every point, every tenth of an hour, yeah. right? And it'll give you all those profiles. Yeah. Um, it'll also give you whatever's here and it's nothing in there. So if I wanted something at 33.17 yeah. hours, yeah. I could put that into add, and I'll get it for everybody. Okay, so it's not in the data set, it's somewhere else. It's somewhere else, it, yeah. and it's just getting you out of having to put it into the data set. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's beyond the scope of this, um, but there's a way to, to abstract this sampling design to say like, well, I've got some people that are two weeks, some people that are 24 weeks. And you can say, well, I want these people to be two weeks, I want these people to be 24 weeks, and you can assign that. Um, so it's it's like this, but you're saying some people get this, some people get that, and so it can get kind of custom. Um, but I'd say so you can either go get really custom and say, okay, I'm gonna just only simulate the times that I want. But a lot of times it's just simpler just to simulate everything and then just filter it out later. It just depends on how much data you're generating. Um, I've got a vignette on the website that shows you how to do that. Um, so you can. Um, say like, well, I want a lot of observations around the peak, but then I want sparse, then I want a trough, and you, you can put that together. It's called a, 
how to show you. So T grid is like start, end, delta. So this is a T grid object, and it just starts at a certain time, it ends at a certain time, it goes through delta. So I can say, um, let's say, let's say sparse. So I can say S time, S time sparse. That's what it gives me, right? So this is just like what's going on in the model object, except it's abstracted out, so we're getting this. So I want to say peak. It's from 0.25 to 2.5 by 0.25 by whatever. So I think my peak's somewhere in there. And then I can say my design. I can combine those together. And now I get all of them together. So you can kind of make this kind of in a modular way to target this concentration or, or this time or that time. Um, sometimes I do it, I, I, I do this mainly when you've got a really long simulation and you say, well, I want. I want to get the week 52 dose. I want to get this out, right? You don't want to simulate the whole year's worth of data just to get that week 52. Um, and sometimes, like, I could say this des plus 52 times 168. So I could get the week uh, 52 if I'm in hours here, right? And I could get what this is. I could say this is my, I want this time out. Um, it's not doesn't it's not super kind of convenient. Like a lot of the stuff, you could just pr add add into that add. Like that add it was an ad hoc vector of times that you wanted to simulate. You could always throw it in there. Sometimes I do that, and sometimes I'm just getting more fancy. I might put it into these objects and kind of combine them and that kind of thing. So the, the, most of the stuff we're going to do today, it's just really kind of default output, and everybody gets the same design. But you can customize a lot of this stuff. Um, but the, but the, the thing that I'd say is that, I mean, I just very, very rarely would I actually code doses into like this template for the de novo uh, uh, data set. I, I don't, these, are, these are almost always uh, no observation records, and I find some way else to get the output records in there. Yeah. So that's that data set. It's just a little twist that um, not terribly different. Um, I'll, I'll bypass this EV assign. Basically, if you've got an I data set and I've got people in different groups, group one and group two, let's just say I've got this population and I said I want group one to get 100 milligrams and I want group two to get 200 milligrams. So I get just pass in these event objects and I get say assign these based on, oops, I get to say just assign these based on the group column and it'll generate a data set. It'll say who's in group one they get this dose. Who's in group two? They get that dose, and that kind of thing. It's a little more complicated. It's a little bit harder to wrap your head around. But this came out of just it turned out to be convenient at one point. Um, it takes it would take me a while to get this far to actually doing this this way. Okay, so do you, maybe um, so we got lunch at twelve thirty, um, and we've got about twenty minutes. Do you want to start on this uh, GCSF? Uh, hands on and we can keep going on after lunch. It's not terribly complicated. So if you do, at least maybe we can get it introduced and um, people can kind of come back and work on it. And this is kind of back on that weight-based dosing example. Um, if you go to exercises folder, um, there's a gcsf.r file. Um, the reference here is, and I'll pull up the reference after the, um, uh, I don't think we'll have too much time to work on that, but we'll get started. So um, this is in model gcsf.cpp. Yeah, maybe, we'll, maybe we should do something with this. Sorry. I'm going to go back to model gcsf. So if you open up the GCSF model, um, you can get to the reference here. I think you can pull this down. No, this is JQuint Farm. You can. Um, population modeling of Filgerstrom, PKPD, and healthy adults. Um, 
following intravenous and subcutaneous administrations. Um, this is just really copied from, translated from a non-mem file. So if you look in the code, it might be just we'll get we'll we'll do something on the on the uh, uh, model specification, but um, I guess for now we can just look and just say like in the compartments there's an absorption compartment, and so we're going to do subcutaneous dosing. So let's put the dose into this absorption compartment, um, and we're going to look at for the output we're going to look at. Uh, I think it's just going to be, well, you can look at either one. You can look at CP, which is going to be the filgrostim concentration, um, or you can look at RESP, which is going to be response. That's going to be the, um, the uh, neutrophil counts. Uh, uh. And in the, um, and, I'll pull, and I'll pull up the paper after lunch so we can look at it a little bit. So they do like a couple, um, they do weight-based dosing. Um, and so your uh, task here is to load up this GCSF model, um, and we want to look at two and a half, five, and ten micrograms per kilogram. And let's just start off by saying let's just do a 50 kilogram, a 70 kilogram, and a 90 kilogram individual. So just three people, and do this per uh, per uh, kilogram. Um, let's do subcutaneous dosing times seven days. Um, and just make a plot of the, we'll do the PK and then you can make a plot of the, the PD as well. Um, and then I put on a, something else here where we can do some random variability. Um, we can do the same dosing, but let's just do maybe 100 people at the two and a half, five and 10 per kilo and let's just assume some parametric distribution for the weight. Um, and so almost all of this is gonna be generating that input data set and making your dosing amounts a function of a weight. So, um, yeah, let's, just, let's just start coding together. We, well, I'll, I'll kind of get us up and started. So this is what I would do if I'm doing this. Um, always start small, so this is a little bit bigger uh, scope here. It seems kind of simple, but there's a couple steps we have to do here. Um, and almost always what I do is get the model loaded and just do some simple simulation just to see what's going on. Get your head, get, wrap your head around what's going on. And um, so let's get the GCSF model out of the model directory. Sorry, I'm just gonna have to plug this out here. So we got a bunch more compartments here. Um, I'm gonna dose into this absorption compartment. And I'm just gonna do a quick, a real quick simulation just to get the lay of the land here. So I'm gonna take my model object. I know um, kind of five milligrams per kilogram is in the target there, so I'm gonna say five times 70 for now. And I guess I'll just do subcutaneous daily dosing and I'm gonna say every 24 hours and uh, so this might be some something in in line of what we want to do just to see what we're what we're dealing with here i'm going to simulate and then i'm going to so i'm going to throw an event at it just going to do my whole profile i'm going to make sure i go out to seven days here, so I'm going to say my end time is 24 times 7, whatever that is, 168, and then I'm just going to make sure I've got a pretty decent uh, resolution on the plot. And I'm going to plot this. And. Uh, And I'm just going to plot out. So I already kind of peeked a little bit that there's a, this compartment called response. Oh, no, maybe there wasn't a response. What was this called? Yeah. There might be an output called response. Let's see. Yeah, there's one. 
yeah, maybe I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. So this is this isn't a compartment, but it's a, uh, it's kind of a function of the residual error. But that's okay. I think it'll be in, it'll get us in the ballpark. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep. So I got all seven doses. Kind of looks kind of funny because it's got this target media dis disposition. So it's kind of a funky model. I'll, I'll pull up the we'll pull up the paper here. Oh, let me just get it here. Um, So this is the the mod, This is the paper. Um, it looks like this. So they got subcutaneous. They've got IV data. Um, this is the model where you've got dosing into the subcutaneous compartment, um, and you've got this kind of receptor mediated uh, business, um, and it's all operating on this. Um, these blood cells that are kind of going through this traffic maturation compartment. Um, it's a pretty complicated model, so I wasn't. Um, anytime I take a model from non mem, especially something that's this complicated, I always code it exactly the way that they coded it because it's the easiest way to make sure I haven't messed something up. Um, but then it also, you kind of like, it takes a while to kind of sit there and go through all the math to see exactly what, what it all is. Um, um, but we recorded it, and you can kind of check it against the. Um, I think this was actually up on, this is up on D.D. Moore, yeah. I think it's the one I also did on D.D. Moore. Oh, well, thanks for the name of this. I think I'm Okay. Sure. We'll see if it's right. Or not. Mm -hmm. um, no, but they, I kind of spent a lot of time just w wondering about that. They, they talk a little bit about this. Um, it's a little bit harder to see on their simulations here. Um, this is the PK for the um, subcutaneous and the IV for just single doses. You can kind of see it a little bit here. This is all in log scale, so it's kind of hard to see, but you can, they, and they talk about this, how they work, the part of the work was to capture this kind of decline in the in the peak over, over time. Um, you can see it's just, it's kind of going down, and, uh, um, but you can see this, this is, this is kind of what we're after here. So we're looking at the GCSF serum concentration, um, and then the uh, absolute neutrophil count, which is that uh, response. So we want to kind of generate both these plots um, and uh, uh, kind of put that put that data set together to get this kind of to try and match up with this. Starting off with just these this sort of deterministic sort of more simulations, and then maybe add this kind of random variability in in the um, in the in the weight. So we can start that and then uh, maybe just kind of work until, um, I, mean, I think we should be down there pretty close to 12.30 since I think they're going to kind of serve us the lunch and everything like that, so it's pretty nice. So um, we'll kind of work until 12.30, then head down and then pick it back up again after the break. So. Uh, yep. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you mentioned this before, but can you simulate it one profile? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to see what the individual parameter estimates that were used to simulate this profile? Uh, yeah. Um, let's wait until the model specification. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So those, those parameters are taking some value, and you're going to say, put this into the output. Mm -hmm. And then whenever they change for individuals, it'll be, it'll get updated. It's kind of like that. It outputs the data as it works through the problem and all that stuff will be yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, I think if you put this on log scale, it just it looks kind of disturbing when you see it on the regular scale. But um, I think this might not be too far from what they're publishing there on the uh, when they put that data on the log scale for the the PK and stuff. Oh, I see. So there's some pretty huge, or pretty significant between subject variability on this. So I was like trying to, I'm like, oh no, man, this thing's looking really crazy here. Um, so I think kind of the intention here, let's just do this. Um, let's just, I just want to look, I want it to look something like the uh, publication. So if we just, uh, if, if you read in the model and then just call that zero RE function, um, and that'll just take out all that random variability and then I think you'll get something that looks a little bit, uh, so this is the ANSI versus time plot uh, and then uh, the 
you can use resp and then this is the um, this is the concentration versus time and I think it's just a little more less extreme example than you might be getting with the random variability in there okay I feel a little bit better now like the, I'm going to totally botch something up That's why I asked if it was possible to see what are, what are the individual parameters yep. because it changed so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, is it huge? Let me go into the model here. So one thing that gets kind of tricky, especially when we're building uh, data sets from event objects, and, we're, and sometimes we're building data sets from event objects, and sometimes we're combining event objects to be other event objects, um, and we're kind of, it can be kind of uh, tricky to figure out like what your output is. Um, is it an event object or is it a data set? And is Emergy Cell going to complain if you try and pass in a data set for an event object, and that kind of thing? And I've been trying to make at least the code a little bit more flexible so that it could take in either where it's possible, um, so that you could pass in either. Um, but we're kind of going with like a, the way to think about it is that if you're, uh, if the function that you call um, inserts an ID into the object, so remember our expand EV, if you, uh, that's gonna come out with an ID column, like that's gonna be a data set, that's gonna be just a data frame. Um, but, what, but when we put two event objects into a sequence, that doesn't necessarily expand it into a population or anything like that. And that's just going to give you back uh, another event object. Um, but it can be kind of, um, I mean, we're trying, I mean, I think it's, everything's pro properly documented, but when you're just getting started, um, it could be a little bit confusing, but uh, that might be one way to, to think about it. That's certainly the way we're trying to organize this. 